actually am about to be live. I'm I'm Jay Fidel. I'm Think Tech Hawaii, and, and I once in a while do these talk shows. And today is with Nicole Lim, and we are very excited about that because she is completely overqualified to do a talk show with us here on Think Tech. So we're delighted that she's coming around, willing to expose herself to our mm, uh, questions. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Nicole. Thanks so much, Jay. I'm super excited to be here and uh, excited to talk story. <laughs> okay. Well, so let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about movers and I was going to say shockers, but I I'm I'm sort of drawn to shakers because it has a double entendre. Did you notice that it has a double entendre, doesn't it? It was very intentional, but it's actually movers and shakas. You should go with your gut. Okay. Whatever. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I if I change the pronunciation during the show, you will understand. Nespa. I'll roll with it. Okay, so um, movers and shockers and is a, is a part of um, another organization. So, so give us the corporate structure. I like to really bore people with corporate structures. What do you say? Awesome. Well, we are lucky to be a part of Hawaii Executive Collaborative. And actually the origins of our program are quite unique. Um, we were born in uh, 2020 during the quarantine times and a group of local business and community leaders came together to try to help the economy um, since tourism was, was pretty much um, totally decimated. And so they thought, you know, how can we attract a different type of visitor, maybe a more socially responsible one that's going to stay longer than the 14 day quarantine. Um, and also, you know, they saw that there was a lot of local kids coming home um, that could because they were remote working. And so thus was born Movers and Chakas. Um, and we've evolved a lot since then in our in our first year, uh, which I'm looking forward to talking about today. Uh, to really focus on brain gain. You know, how do we attract, integrate, and retain key talent, especially returning Kama'aina, uh, to come to Hawaii and really help uh, create a more innovative, sustainable, and resilient uh, state. Very, very important. I mean, there should be lots of you, and you should be doing lots of this. By the way, brain gain um, rhymes with brain drain. Did you notice that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like shockers and shakers and all that so okay i want to tell you that uh, for a time i was the um actually the chair of the um, high tech development corporation it's now called the hawaii tech development corporation um and they had a program similar to this uh this was in the year 2000 2001 right about there um and there were all these um local kids that had gone to the mainland, you know, to, to get into Silicon Valley. And they were smart. They were from the best schools in Hawaii. Um, and they were um, making money in the Silicon Valley. But then it collapsed. Okay. And in any event, the High Tech Development Corporation wanted to bring them back, the brain reversal, and bring them back. So um, <laughs> I'm serious. There were meetings so like every few weeks and uh, to try to, you know, cajole them back. It never worked very well because a lot of them came back and found out there was no jobs anywhere in Hawaii in technology. And that continued and got worse over the decade to follow. But the notion was the same thing. We want to reverse the brain drain. We want to keep our local talent home. We want to invite new talent. We want mm, workforce. Um, we want human resources. That's what you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, we're you know building on a lot of the great work that people have done before and that people continue to try to do to um, make Hawaii's future brighter. And um, a lot of the things you touched on are um, exactly what we're trying to do. And I think that there is no silver bullet, right? Um, and what we're trying to do is take the challenges and opportunities that have been created from COVID during the pandemic and really uh, build on that. So with you know, more remote work, there's more flexibility to choose where you wanna live, um, not based on where you work, but where you have ties, you know, family, friend ties, cultural ties. Um, and that gives a lot of flexibility for people to um, live where they where they want to be. 
Um, but it's not just that, you know, we're, we're trying to look at different ways that we can help uh, Hawaii's economy and, and really do that through helping to build personal relationships. Uh, we work very closely with you, Hero, um, and Carl Bottom has once described our program as an accelerator for interpersonal relationships. So I'm always thinking about that. Like if we can build strong ties here, um, then that will uh, help attract and integrate and retain that talent. So we have two programs. So the cohort fellow program, which um, we're running our second cohort starting this Sunday, really about attracting that talent, especially returning Kama'aina to come and contribute to Hawaii uh, for 30 days and ideally longer, even if they return to the continent, um, they'll stay in touch with the nonprofits and businesses that they work with. Um, maybe returning Kama'aina will think about moving home. Um, so we're really excited about continuing that program with a lot of exciting changes. Um, and another program we're piloting in April and May of this year uh, is called the Hawaii Talent Onboarding Program. So taking the Hawaii Immersion Program, a very place-based orientation that we've um, cultivated through the cohort program and offering that to local employers to really help integrate and retain talent that they bring um, from the continent. Um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, sometimes we um, do go to the mainland for talent and, you know, how do we bring in newcomers? How do we really make them a part of the community and have a sense of belonging, um, which not only you know makes them better at the jobs they do, uh, but really helps enrich the community, right? Um, and create better community members. So we're taking that same kind of program that we've created that focuses on learning, contributing, and connecting, and offering that to um, recently relocated uh, uh, professionals as well. Oh, I have a million questions for you, but the first one is uh, you're, you're having a, a launch. Um, on January 9th, that's only a few days away. Uh, what is that? How important is that? How will we learn more about that? How will we participate about that? How will we know what happened there? Yeah, so we're excited about our second cohort um, that is launching this Sunday. Uh, we have about 20% uh, of the cohort are actually local residents in this, in this current um, rendition. And that was very intentional because we really want to build the bonds of people. And erase those perceived boundaries between what makes someone a local or returning Kama'aina or a visitor and really focus on, you know, the values of Hawaii and how do we help encourage um, uh, people to contribute to Hawaii in their unique professional skill sets. So um, yeah, that's launching this Sunday. Uh, we postponed this cohort from October because of Delta um, into the excitement of Omicron as things would have it. Excitement, um, so... there's a euphemism for you. <laughs> Excitement, okay. <laughs> Learn to be very agile and flexible. I guess so. <laughs> um, and, you know, with our partners, with our cohort fellows, um, always prioritizing the safety of our participants, our volunteers, the community. So uh, we're being very flexible. Um, so are you like being very physical, though? Being very physical. Well, this first, uh, this opening day, um, which is, you know, 12 hours of uh, cultural orientation and education and uh, getting to know their um, volunteer partner organizations for their, their 30 hour projects uh, was intended to be in person, but we have switched to virtual. Um, so we'll continue to make those adjustments. Um, we're very focused on having outdoor open air events, um, but as everyone knows, you know, it's flexibility is the name of the game. It is now, that's for sure. You can change your mind three times in 30 days. <laughs> yeah, if only we could get a schedule from, from uh, the different variants, that would be really helpful. Um, but yeah, we're excited. It's a 30-day program that they will be on island. Many people are staying longer than that. I would say um, about 80% are staying two months or longer. And um, a lot of them are staying at our quote unquote Olympic village. We have a great partnership with the Waikiki Malia by Outrigger. Um, so the cohort fellows who wanted to stay there um, uh, will be staying there. We, we don't provide um, any um, accommodations, um, but we do provide a free round trip ticket from uh, the mainland to Hawaii. And uh, yeah, we're really excited. Um, you want to think about a one-way ticket. What do you say, Nicole? Give him a one-way ticket. 
some of them, stop, some stop of them, them were really like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've had we had a couple of people from the first cohort um, move back home, actually return in Kamaina. So uh, anything is possible, um, yeah, and yeah. we're just excited to um, be able to bring really talented professionals together who care, you know. And that's that's what we select for. We look at uh, potential long term contribution to Hawaii, um, such as their existing ties. Like, are they in a position to hire remote workers um, from Hawaii? Um, you know, what are their existing um, relationships here in Hawaii? We look at program fit. You know, it's really important that people uh, are interested in contributing to their communities and, you know, have demonstrated that in the past. And then we look at um, their fit to the 10 projects that we uh, curated before the application process. Oh, can um, you talk about the 10 projects? This, I can. This is, now it's really getting interesting. 30 days, 10 projects. That's one project yeah. every three days, you know? Well, it's one project per, per team of five. So we okay, have okay. Uh, 10 project teams. Um, each one tends to have a current resident on it. So it's like intentionally um, mixed to have that kind of cross-pollination magic. Um, but we're really lucky to work with 10 amazing nonprofits and startups here in Hawaii. Um, three of them are returning from cohort one. So we'll be working with Pa'i Foundation, um, with Auntie Vicky um, on uh, Regional Media Center. Um, we'll be working um, with Chamber of Commerce Hawaii again um, with the DOE um, and I think three or four Westside High Schools on STEM work-based learning projects. Uh, and we're working with um, the Pantry by Feeding Hawaii together, um, again, with Janine and her amazing team uh, to help them expand. Uh, and this cohort, we're excited to um, introduce uh, seven new partners. We tried to focus on a few sectors that we felt Hawaii was uniquely positioned to lead and you know, could be critical to our internal sustainability. So looking at agriculture and ag tech, um, clean tech, renewable energies, and um, kind of affordable housing, you know, houselessness. So um, some examples of that, you know, we're working with um, the Hawaii Agriculture Foundation uh, to help uh, create a- And yeah, we gave them or, an award. We gave them an award at Christmas. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah so Denise gonna, Yamaguchi there. Yeah, Denise Yamaguchi, who we're lucky enough to have on our board as well. Um, we'll be helping them to develop a localicious app or web website um, to promote local producers, uh, agriculture and fish and um, uh, other resources. Um, we are working with um, North Shore and Economic Vitality Partnership to um, help group GAP certified some of their small, smaller farmers. Uh, we're working with um, Pictured on how we can attract R&D from um, mainland companies to come and test their uh, their products um, here and kind of help build out the innovation sector. Um, we are working with Kamehameha Schools on kind of a live work care um, building that they're looking to redevelop. So it really, it really runs the gamut. Uh, we get to work with students, we get to work with uh, nonprofits and uh, startups. Actually, one startup I should mention coming out of UH um, is called Nimbus AI. They have this really cool like cloud coverage uh, algorithmic prediction that helps solar tech companies, um, you know, be more efficient. So oh, very we're excited nice. to- Is that of engineering or mathematics? Which department? I, I I'm not actually sure. I will have to check on that, but uh, it's all above all above my head. But it's pretty exciting that you can predict clouds. Oh, that's fabulous! I remember, for example, uh, there were some fellows with Oceanit um, that used um, laser um, to determine a, a database program to determine uh, which was the optimal direction uh, that a wind turbine should face. No, to get the most efficient use of the wind. I said, wow, right here in Hawaii, doing that, this, the Nimbus program sounds just like that, actually. Um, you know, helping, helping another, another uh, effort, another, another organization with technology they might never have thought of. I love when that happens, actually. But let me, let me ask you, where, where's the focus here? Is it on, uh, maybe it's on all things you mentioned, but um, is, it, is it on people connecting? 
local people, with people from the mainland who spend 30 days in, in proximity, sort of like APCSS, you know, one of the, you know, the uh, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies uh, at Fort DeRussi, right? Um, there, they teach, of course, they teach from the American point of view, and they, they try to uh, show these management people from Asia, often military or government people, um, that the U.S. you know is in there for altruistic reasons, and in many ways that that is the norm. Um, and what they do is they they put different representatives of different countries together in the same condo. So by the time their stint is finished. They know people they would never have met, and they have lived with these people, and they have spent time, your, your, your word, bonding, um, you know, with, with these people, you know, from other countries and other disciplines and so forth. So I guess bonding is a, an important part of what you're doing. And, and I guess, um, you know, looking into the technology for these various areas you're talking about, I know you haven't finished, there are more, um, but... For ag ag agriculture, for example, is, you know, we the more technology we put in agriculture, the easier it is for young people to get involved in agriculture because it's you know you have to you leverage the effort, you you have a better chance of a successful outcome in your crop and all that. Um, but the third thing, and I haven't heard you that talk that much about it, and that is the entrepreneurial aspect. Uh, it sounds like you're exposing the uh, members of the cohorts to entrepreneurs, but are you teaching them how to establish companies? Yeah, lots of great points uh, there, Jay. So I guess starting from the top, um, you know, cross-pollination and, and bringing different minds and perspectives together uh, is, is, is at the core of our program, right? This is why we have a diversity of like local residents, uh, returning Kalmyana visitors, different industries, different functions, uh, people from all over the country, actually pretty widespread um, all over the country. Um, and this is very intentional because we think that there can be um, interesting, innovative ideas that come together. And if we are to bring everyone together and help create that shared vocabulary in a way, which is what we try to do through the cultural education, we also, um, we have Naha Native Hawaiian Hospitality Association come in and talk about Native Hawaiian um, values and culture and language. Um, we're having an interesting panel with different community leaders on the challenges and opportunities as Hawaii is a melting pot. And we have um, Glenn Furuya coming in to talk about, you know, the unique blend of Polynesian, Asian and Western influences and in, in kind of communication and culture here in Hawaii. So our hope is that you know we can prepare people um, to be able to communicate and connect with the community and um, structure things in a way that that allows bonding and then see what happens afterwards. So it's both a science and an art, and a lot of the magic happens um, in a way that can't be predicted. Um, and our role is really to kind of create that environment, foster those connections, and and really actually help facilitate the connections um, for that to happen. Um, we've been lucky uh, after cohort one, you know, we had a uh, cohort fellow, Teddy Liao, who's the CEO of a company called NextRep, a remote call center. We connected him with DBED um, and they were able to um, partner to help uh, launch the pilot for remote work. Um, and I believe as of late last year, there was, you know, about 300 plus uh, remote opportunities that had been created for Hawaii residents. Um, you know, that's not something that I can put into my strategic plan um, to know will happen. But if we're able to connect people together and really identify the type of people who have the resources and heart really to want to contribute, um, anything is possible. And our role is really to help create that space and also um, to bridge that gap between understanding local needs and access to kind of that, that national supply of talent. Uh, to bring people together. Um, mm. So, you know, that's really, that's really the aim of the program. Um, what and, about entrepreneurship? Have you entrepreneurship, encouraged yeah. the creation of companies? Have you taught them about how to create a company? Uh, we're not, we're not uh, focused on that. Like, you know, a lot of the amazing accelerators that we have in Hawaii, um, like uh, Blue Startups or Elemental um, Accelerator, 
but are um, mana up. But we do actually work with uh, the startups um, to because uh, the accelerators because we want to offer the expertise that we bring in to their um, to their companies. Um, and the hope is that you know we will bring in people who will um, potentially move here and start companies, but it's not necessarily the sole focus. And I think that there is such a robust ecosystem uh, that there is so much that can be done by bringing smart and talented and experienced people together who have the right intentions, the right heart to, to contribute uh, to the community. Mm. You know, I worry, I worry about the tech industry here. You know, it, it met a lot of resistance uh, from and after the time I, I told you uh, I was with the High Tech Development Corp. And, and since then, and a lot of people came under Act 221, a tax tech credit, a, a tech tax credit back back in the uh, first decade. Um, you know, when, when 221 failed and ended and was early sunset, um, they left. And that was a huge loss for Hawaii because these people had been working here and they, uh, many of them had been trained or come from the mainland. Yeah? So, you know, the big thing is whether to me, the larger environment supports the notion of, of giving homage, giving support, encouragement to the human resources you're talking about. And that means the legislature, the governor, all the agencies and the business community. Uh, I know you have some support from the business community, and I'm happy to hear there are accelerators that are functioning, three or four of them you mentioned. That's great. But are you satisfied with the environment that um, expresses appreciation and encouragement um, for the members of these cohorts? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it takes a village, right? It takes an ecosystem. And um we have a big challenge in front of Hawaii with a lot of you know, smart people trying to tackle it in different ways. Um, so from our perspective, you know, we're a small program and uh, we will continue to work um, with the, our partners um, that we're excited to learn from as well. And you know, we, as a small program, get the opportunity to really test things very quickly um, and working with you know, systemic level partners like you Hero and DBED um, to really see how we can, uh, what role we can play. So um, it's not, there's no so, silver bullet. I think we've heard lots of people say that. Um, and it's going to be all about each of us, individuals, organization, businesses, government, uh, kind of doing our piece, right? Um, our piece of the puzzle and then coming together so we can see the bigger picture and, and collaborate together. Yeah, so, collaboration yeah. is everything, isn't it? Among organizations like yours, nonprofits like yours. And and you have to keep on trucking. You, you know, you can't, you can't fade. You have to keep, you know, sustainability is best met when you're sustainable. Did I say that? Yeah, I, I actually said that. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to ask you about this possibility. Suppose you become aware. Now, you're Iolani and Wharton. So you have a Rolodex, okay? And you know some people in the East Coast, I mean, uh, like even on Wall Street where you might have gone but decided not to. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe those people would be useful members of the cohort or at least of the workforce, the human resources that we would like to connect with here to build, you know, the brains, the, the brain gain. Um, but they're not coming. On the other hand, as you also mentioned, we have Zoom, and and the, the the COVID has taught us about Zoom. It has opened new vistas about Zoom. Okay, so if I if I give you somebody in I don't know, let's say Manhattan, and say, look, you know, Hawaii is a great place. We have great culture. We have a great people thing going on here, um, and we can really use your talent. We know you can't come. We know that. Uh, for one reason or another, who knows what it is. But we know also that you have a nice laptop and you can join us by Zoom all day long and you can consult and confer. You can even be part of a cohort, theoretically, even though you're not physically here. And you can be within our embrace. Are you doing that? Have you thought about that? Will you do that in the future? I mean, that is exactly what our program is about. Um, we do believe that that in-person um, foundation, though, is so important. And as I mentioned, we believe that a lot of the magic will continue to happen after the cohort, um, but really starting with that really strong connection to begin with. Um, and, you know, people have continued to contribute since going back um, to the mainland. 
uh, working with their nonprofits, you know, being connected with other organizations here in Hawaii. Uh, so it's that same mentality. Um, I think, you know, the virtualness of, of the internet allows that to continue. And there's still very much a huge impact that can be made um, in person, right? Being here in Hawaii, like understanding what our community is about, like understanding um, the land as well and, you know, like being in it, which is why, you know, we take the time to, you know, go um, and, you know, help restore Huilua Fish Pond or, you know, work in the Lo'i. This, this time uh, we'll be partnering with Ka'ala Farm. Um, so, you know, all of those things, the experiential piece, I think, is so important um, that will really help people connect. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it enables a lot of uh, continued contribution. And it's also very important to kind of create that foundation. Yeah, well, you know, we live in a world where it's, it's really important to connect. And furthermore, there are lots of tools to connect. And the truth is tools today that were not around 10 years ago at all. And, and um, people are aware of the tools. They could or they can or they do use the tools. So I wanted to ask you one other thing, and that's this. We have a very, you know, and I'm sure they talk about this at Wharton every single day. We have a very funny kind of economy going on now. You know, we've been for two years now plus, um, we've been living under the, 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 the black cloud of, of COVID. Um, a lot of people don't work. They don't want jobs. They resign from jobs. They can't have jobs. A lot of businesses fail. Um, every time you turn around, something else is failing. Um, and, you know, there are those who feel um, that the economy is like uh, on a precipice, on a precipice. You know, you can have a robust stock market, but that's not necessarily based on reality. I used to think it was. I know I no longer think it's based on reality, but there we are. The stock market is the very top. And, you know, locally, too, there's, there's a lot of people who are not productive as they used to be, not ambitious. They don't have a plan. It's hard to have a plan in the time of COVID. And plans are essential to business. Essential. You can't, how can you build a business without a plan? And you can't make a plan if you don't know what's going to happen next month. Um, you know, uh, Omicron is not the last variant. Always have to remember that the thing mutates while you watch. And the more cases, the more mutations, it's, it's, uh, it's syllogistic. So anyway, um, my question to you, which is not intended to be an easy question, is how can you have all this optimism about putting people together and making a robust you know, state of newly revitalized, vitalized, you know, kids and human resources to create a great economy when the economy is under a black cloud and it's uncertain and you don't know how sustainable it will be. Um, how do you deal with that? I think there are always opportunities with big challenges. And this program is a an example of that, right? Of, uh, an innovation born out of a big challenge. And uh, all the things you mentioned are very daunting. Um, and I also know that we have to try, right? We might fail many, many times, but it's important that we try and continue to innovate. Um, and so that's what keeps me optimistic because I think that there's a lot of people with great skills and a lot of heart. Um, and I firmly believe that we can bring them together and we'll be in a better place than if we don't try, for sure. You know, you described an ecosystem, which is admirable. And I, you know, I've seen many parts of that ecosystem. And I, I agree with you that it is admirable. People coming together and doing things for the benefit of the community. I mean, Hawaii does have that. We do have your part of that. And admiration goes to you. Um, but the question is, where is it going? Um, sustainability. Uh, but we need Actually, I'm going to tell you something, Nicole. We need more than sustainability. We need growth. We need expansion. We, we need it to be bigger and better every time you look. It should thrill you and, and uh, excite you every time you look. Are we going there? I sure hope so. And um, I, <laughs> I hope to be a part of it, you know, cohort by cohort, day by day, um, person by person. And that's how we're going to make an impact. We're going to find needle movers uh, who can make exponential impact. So, yeah, I remain optimistic. How will you know? What are the metrics? What are the experiences? What's the, 
the feedback that will make you know that you have been successful in these efforts, that you have taken it where you wanted to, that you have achieved the mission, at least, at least in substantial part. How will you know? Well, we gather lots of data, <laughs> lots of survey data, um, and try to quantify these things. Um, and that's why we work with you, Hero and DBED, you know, trying to measure over time. Uh, but, you know, a, a deeper kind of heart answer is, you know, are we bringing people together and is the product of that bringing together good for the state? Are we having a positive impact um, on economic growth, on bringing families back together? You know, there's a lot of different ways to measure, you know, KPIs. There's a lot of different ways to measure impact. And I think that you know, we're very focused on, on measuring all those pieces, but at the end of the day, like, are we making a positive impact on Hawaii? Um, and if we can answer that in all the different ways, you know, qualitative and quantitatively, I think that's the key. And that means we keep on going, we keep on trying, we keep on innovating, we keep on learning um, and marching towards, um, you know, growth and expansion and all those amazing things you mentioned. Uh, while keeping people at the center of that mission. Yeah, well, you know, um, uh, it's it's about leadership, and uh, certainly, you know, the ecosystem you described has plenty of leadership, plenty of admirable people, um, but you also need leadership in government. I mentioned before, there are those who feel that government has not done enough, or let me put it this way, you know, in our tumultuous democracy, which is not only tumultuous in Washington, it's tumultuous here too, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get a handle on a given value and initiative. What happens is they turn over. Mm, you got new elections, new people in office, new people appointed, and so forth. So my last question to you, which is not intended to be easy, is it? <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what is your message to the government of Hawaii? All of the elected officials, all of your appointed officials, all the bureaucrats, all the people who work for government and have something to say about the way government operates and the way it engages with you and your cohorts. What, what, what message would you like to leave for them, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, we actually uh, try to work very closely with government. Um, and I do believe that the key is public private partnerships. You know, there is kind of the scale and heft that the government has and reach, which I think is so important. And, you know, the private sector has more agility, right? Like we can move much more quickly because we're smaller. Um, we can test and learn much faster. And so I believe that the secret to move forward is that public-private partnership, that we work together, collaborate, um, are able to each do what we do well um, and move together that way. So yeah, no, no scathing words, unfortunately. Jay. Oh no, I'm not seeking but, that. Um, just no, just positive, I, positive advice to them. The session yeah. is about to start. Unfortunately, it's probably not going to be a physical session. But, you know, I'm just seeking your advice to them about what the priorities should be, where this fits. Yeah, I think this should be a key priority. Um, and we're really lucky to work with DBED, um, have uh, spoken a lot with different senators and representatives as well. Um, and I know that there's just a lot of interest in that public-private partnership and being able to help fund and, and sponsor initiatives like ours um, that try to move very quickly, right, and agilely um, so that, and with intention, I should say, um, so that we can take it to a higher, um, more scaled level uh, together with the government and, and other large organizations. So I think it's really exciting. You know, I like to be this kind of scrappy, smaller program uh, but also get to work with, um, you know, the government and, and, and large organizations and businesses uh, to really make as big of an impact that we can together for, for our state. That's great, Nicole. I only have one last question, which I cannot resist. This is your third you. last question, Dan. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> it's the way it goes. And we're overtime too, but hey, that's the way it goes. I can really relate to what you're doing, but scrappy nonprofits is very important. And, uh, you know, they do a lot in the community. Um, so my last question is uh, movers and shockers. Where did that come from? And what role did you have in establishing that name? Uh, 
that came from the board, uh, came up with that. And I actually um, came on afterwards. So uh, the reason I got involved was actually part of some of the initial public backlash, local backlash we had against the program. So I found out about the program through a mainland acquaintance and was viscerally upset about it, you know, thinking like, why are we bringing outsiders in during COVID? They're going to drive my rent up, uh, destroy the Aloha spirit. Um, and I had just been traveling for five years as an outsider in other global communities. And so that cognitive dissonance was so strong uh, within me that um, I wrote an op-ed article in the Star Advertiser, um, kind of exactly what I just said, talked about, those um, kind of initial uh, resistance to the program and, and literally being viscerally upset about it. Um, and also reflected, though, on on that feeling, you know, that anti-outsider feeling being so innate, so um, kind of that us versus them tribal mentality. And we have to acknowledge those feelings. And we also have to ask ourselves, you know, how do we welcome newcomers? Like, how is this, this is not a zero sum game, you know, like even if we emotionally want to shut everyone else out, um, that's actually not beneficial for us. So. You know, being able to acknowledge those emotions and feelings and then, you know, think about how do we hold everyone accountable to the community. So um, in a twist of fate uh, and a very ironic and fortuitous one for me, um, a few of the founding board members reached out uh, to see if I would like to run the program. Um, and uh, I was very surprised. But once I found out, you know, how dedicated the business and community leaders were behind this program, it felt like a dream job um, for me, you know, like being able to come home as a returning Kama'aina to take all those uh, privileged experiences um, on the on the mainland, both in education and career, um, and apply that here to Hawaii, um, and in a very entrepreneurial way, and working in an ecosystem. That's my dream job. So um, I continue to do it, and I'm I'm excited about it. It shows. It shows. But, you know, also, I just want to mention uh, as we go off the air here that, um, uh, you know, finding cognitive dissonance actually can be beneficial. You heard it here on Think Think Deep <laughs> with Nicole Lim of Movers and Shockers. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for having me. Aloha. 